it's not like these things are new. You know, people have always had their performance measured, you know, and, and having incentives. What is new with gamification is really two things. The first one is uh, it's just much faster, right? You know, it used to be that you would only get a review like every quarter, every half year or every year. Whereas with gamification, like everything you do gets reviewed. I mean, literally every Uber ride you do gets, you know, uh, reviewed. You can be reviewed every like five minutes, you know, in a warehouse and get scored on that. Just so the feedback loop is far tighter. And so the level of control is tighter. Okay, let's kick off. Adrian, thank you so much for joining me on another session of kickoff sessions. I've done some many research into your background. I thought it was super interesting how, you know, you went super deep on game development and working in that industry. And now you're coming up with books around this area, which is even more kind of more impressive, but it's also alarming to see this stuff happening in the 21st century. This is what I was thinking. I was like, there's a guy here who has a lot of background in mobile development and game development. And I was writing books in, uh, in real life. So I'm excited for this. Um, well, glad to be here. Thanks, Aaron. The first question I wanted to ask you was all about producing like well-engineered games. Yeah. So for you over the years, like how has that kind of developed? What, what are the key components? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is having just a good hook to the game idea, you know. Um, you know, for Zombies Run, uh, our, our big game, it was like, well, how can we make running more fun? Um, people know how zombies work. Uh, mm -hmm. let, let, let's uh, have you run away from them. Um, you know, we've done other games uh, where... Uh, you know, you're sort of a secret agent or, or that sort of thing. I think then it's really being sort of honest about what your strengths and weaknesses are and what the opportunities are, you know, for you as a production team. You know, I'm always like, very interested in like, you know, if you look at the people you have or the people you can get and do you have like an amazing artist who's like really excited to work in a particular style or do you have, you know, someone who's like a really good, audio production person and maybe they haven't done that in a company before but you know they can do that and so almost sort of like molding the thing you're making around the skills that you have in the team and I've always thought that you know if you let people work on something that they're excited to do uh, and and that they're good at doing then then that's like where you'll get the best results mm, yeah because people will kind of lean towards what they enjoy the most and then they're going yeah. to get better at it because continuously working on it. How do you how do you pick those people? Like, how do you know that this person is going to be someone that's going to be part of the team? I mean, you know, we worked with the same. Some people on the team have been been around for like over ten years now, uh, which is a long time in the games industry. And you know, you you just sort of work with them and you get to know what they're like. And um, you know, I try I just try and talk to them and try and like you know chat about like, hey, so what are you into? You know, like and you yeah. know. Or talk about new stuff that's happened in game development or on technology and you know i'm just excited when i hear that that someone is like really enthusiastic about this new method of working or and and so it does mean that you you need to sort of have that time to chat about things that aren't directly related to work you know definitely and that's where you're kind of building more of like a, a better culture within the team and people are yeah. actually like much more involved and it's funny because like that creative element like for game development i imagine it's all creative uh comes from people kind of working on their own and being able to develop an idea and then just go further down it versus you telling them to say do this do this do this they kind of come well, to their own realizations you know it is a mix you know like in some game development companies, it, it's basically a factory, to be perfectly honest, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then others, you know, you're you're doing something new all the time. And and uh, in most, it's a bit of a mix, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're making like Assassin's Creed 15 or Call of Duty, you know, 10 or whatever, then it's like you, you kind of know what game you're making. And um, that doesn't mean there isn't creativity in those different aspects so for example if you're making a new map for one of these games you can still be creative in that map right but fundamentally you know the technology you're using is probably not massively different and so in smaller indie games of course if it's just like a few people then then you do have a chance to do something completely different and new um it's it's a mix you know i think people you know like doing the newest thing sometimes can be a little bit overrated because when you do that, then you're going to run into a lot of technical issues that maybe haven't been solved or you need to solve. 
And that doesn't feel very creative. It just feels annoying. <laughs> um, <laughs> where, where, you know, whereas if you if you're like making, you know, um, you know, if you're writing a book or, or if you are, you know, doing something in a more kind of known system, then maybe you don't run into those problems as much. But then you are mm. kind of making something that is a bit more similar to what's been out there. So you do need that mix between, you know, having like creative ideas, but also being able to to you know try and make things smooth where they can be mm, it's like standing on the shoulders of people who have gone before you and then you're yeah. kind of like earring and kind of improving on it yeah there's, there's lots of interesting kind of ways to look at that because assassin's creed and whatnot will be like the big corporations the bigger go yeah. the bigger entities you know it's the same in the startup space i'm working in, in fintech it's a similar similar kind of style you know i wanted to ask you about kind of human psychology around game development how much of it is positioned on researching and how humans kind of interact with the system how, how does that kind of work well i mean the, the fact is that most you know obviously um you know video games interact with people's psychology a fair bit um i think that the you know most video game developers don't you know read psychology research right they don't read psychology books and and they aren't kind of thinking about that really rigorously other than maybe you know this idea of variable ratio reinforcement you know that you see in casinos where you sort of go and open up you know a treasure chest and you don't know what's going to be inside so it's kind of exciting that there might be something good this time you know like in pokemon go or role-playing games um you know I, I so i don't think that games treat it as a science uh i but they do do play testing and they will you know be tweaking the variables and especially in live games, so games that are just, you know, always ongoing, um, you know, some of these have economists, you know, some of these will like run experiments on, on people while, you know, they're playing. And so again, it's not really psychology, but it's just like, it's really about like, how can they maximize like engagement and how can they maximize revenue? Mm. Because like a lot of all companies and all kind of even startups are, you know, they obviously try maximize like weekly active users, daily active users and trying to get that stickiness. But I'm kind of interested to learn about, you know, from a game developer perspective, do they look at real like psychology and try pinpoint into like the reward system, the gamification element, because, you know, you might see that not really being implemented for other industries. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think some of them do, um, but, but really, you know, it's not like you can go into like the research and it tells you do these things and you'll have an addictive video game. Like, you, you know, like it, it, it's not quite, it's not quite like that. It's more like, okay, we know we have these levers to pull and, and we, and, and we've seen that other video games are really popular uh, and really sticky by using streaks, by using achievements, by using, you know, all these different tricks. And we're going to use those and we're going to try some different ones and we'll see mm -hmm. where that works. So it's kind of almost like a very fast trial and error and learning from other, you know, other successful, you know, games. You know, one of the things I always tell people is that if psychologists, you know, were like so good at like figuring out how to make successful video games and all my professors at university would be millionaires, which, which they aren't, <laughs> you know, that's just not what they look at. Yeah. And even, even like how to treat patients who have suffering issues, like if you knew as much about, like the research and how to implement it, well, then we, all our problems will be fixed. Does that make yeah. sense? We'll be able to sure. apply different yeah. principles to it. So when you've approached You've Been Played, your new book, which I'd like to give you a, a nice get a good overview of it, I thought it was quite interesting to see how, you know, you've worked in mobile development and now you're seeing this stuff happen in real life. Yeah. But what was kind of the reason why you wanted to write that book? Well, I mean, you know, I've been effectively working in gamification for you know the best part of like my career like in you know, a 15 years we we used to make educational games you know we used to make you know games that would motivate people to do stuff in the real world and and you know zombies run our main game um is all about making running exciting and so if you open up like a gamification textbook or you know if you go to a gamification conference people will be talking about the games that that i've made um but like increasingly i guess i've be become quite like sort of confused and and a little bit like worried uh about the kinds of gamification you know i'm seeing out in the real world and so i think everyone like 
everyone has seen gamification, you know, in their own, you know, in the apps they use. So if you've got an Apple Watch, you know, you'll know that you get these achievements. If you use Duolingo, then then of course that's gamified. You know, you've got a lot of other exercise apps like, you know, or games like uh, Ring Fit Adventure. But I think the thing that was um, really, that, that really sort of caught my attention was when I started seeing gamification in the workplace, you know, so companies like Amazon using gamification to try and motivate workers, Uber, uh, Lyft, you know, um, call center workers, Microsoft, you know, all, all these things are being gamified. And it was kind of like one thing for consumers, you know, to use gamification. It got more and more uncomfortable for me when I saw gamification being kind of, um, you know, becoming mandatory, you know, uh, mm. be, be, you know, people being forced to play these games basically as part of their work. And is there, where... is there, um, you know, a good side to gamification? So just like your zombies run, which of course inspires people to do be more healthy and same with Duolingo, is there a side of gamification that's actually beneficial? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously, I think that otherwise I wouldn't be doing it, you know. Yeah, um, yeah look, I, I think that gamification is such a wide thing now. I mean, there's probably billions of people who are, who are, you know, being exposed to gamification in some way. You know, there are, you know, good books and bad books, you know, there's good TV shows and bad TV shows, you know, or, or these thing, TV shows where that will kind of stand the test of time. And you think, wow, that was just amazing. And you see other ones which are just kind of like, eh, it's a bit, it's a bit trashy. I think with gamification, it's, it's a bit different because obviously it, it's interactive, you know, and it has the ability to kind of change people's behavior. Um, if I were to sort of try and classify the good gamification versus bad gamification, I think for, for good gamification, we try and make it really transparent what we're doing. It's like, you know, if you go and download Duolingo or, or Zombies Run, it will say that it's a game, you know, and, you know, no one's being kind of fooled into this. Um, it's trying to help you do something that you already want to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to get fit, you know, if you want to learn a language, you know, if you want to learn a musical instrument, that sort of thing, you know, the gamification will be there to you know, try and make that a little bit more fun for you. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think that you have other gamification where it's kind of a little bit different. It's more like, well, but companies are deploying gamification to make you um you know better at doing your job as far as they see it right and that and that sort of gets a little bit more complicated so for some companies you know um they will say hey we're gamifying your job and giving you stars and badges and quests and missions uh in order to make your job more fun mm -hmm. and i think if that were like true then maybe that would be fine. But actually, if you look at these games, they don't look like fun at all. They, they look just incredibly boring. <laughs> um, you know, and that's what people who, who play them say. And actually what it looks like is that these companies are using gamification to try and um, obfuscate people's compensation and to reduce pay in some cases. And so I'd say, well, that's not really good. <laughs> you know, I don't you know, really agree with that, yeah. And it's interesting because I've seen that kind of evolution happen over time because it looks like, you know, the basic level of gamification within companies is promotions and ladders. Like there's literally a hierarchy of ladders and the word is used as if it's a game. You go from rung to rung yeah. to rung. Along there, you'll get payment, bo uh, payment compensation, bonuses and, and whatnot. And then it's like it gets micro broken down then and you see different examples. And I'm kind of looking at maybe even like larger, you know, con considered good jobs. Um, but it's like they're always playing you around quarters, half year cycles, yeah. full year cycles. And I've heard firsthand people saying, oh, well, you know, if I just do this and do this um, extra kind of work benefit or, or get involved with something else outside, well, then I'm in line to get promoted. And I was yeah. very, I was very, because I'm quite young, I'm 26. And when I first came into my career in 2023, I, I could clearly see this. But what I wanted to ask you was like, from the research you did, how aren't some people aware of it, though? You know, the, the Uber example, the Amazon example. Are people not familiar that this is actually happening to them right now? Well, I, th I think people, I mean, in, in some cases, it's pretty overt, you know? So, like, in, in Amazon warehouses, they will have these screens showing 
like i mean things that look like video games right you know so the more boxes you pack the faster your dragon flies versus other people's dragons like they they, they kind of know you know everyone knows this, this is a game you don't have to play it but you, you kind of might as well otherwise it's just nothing else to do um and you can get like a little prize in some cases but by, by mm -hmm. coming first um i think in some other companies it's less apparent so like for uber you know, they, they keep on introducing and removing gamification. So often what will happen is, you know, they'll say, hey, do you want to sign up to this quest? If you do 20, you know, rides today, then we'll give you a $6 bonus, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it's like, obviously it matters to some people. And so I don't know whether those people are thinking, wow, my life is being gamified. But I think in a way, probably... For those companies, it's better if people don't notice too much because they don't really want people thinking about about the existence of the game. They want mm -hmm. people more thinking about you know how to change their behavior, you know, in response to the incentives. And I think the thing that you said about salaries and you know reviews and quarterly reviews is really interesting because it's not like these things are new. You know, people have always <laughs> had their performance measured, you know, and and having mm -hmm. incentives. What is new with gamification? It's really two things. The first one is uh, it's just much faster, right? You know, it used to be that you would only get a review like every quarter, or every half year, or every year. Whereas with gamification, like everything you do gets reviewed. I mean, literally every Uber ride you do gets, mm -hmm. you know, uh, reviewed. You can be reviewed every like five minutes, you know, in a warehouse and get scored on that. Just a, the feedback loop is far tighter and so the level of control is tighter and mm -hmm. that that feels very different than than only getting feedback you know for better or for worse you know um you know less frequently but the second oh. yeah go on go ahead sir i didn't mean to interrupt you um well no i mean the the, the second thing i was going to say is is that the the big difference as well is that like all of this uses video game aesthetics so it's kind of like you know confetti and you know achievement badges and points and like little you know animal characters and dragons and all this stuff you know really mm -hmm. really fun exciting things and um these are you know these are aesthetics from that people recognize from video games right and people know the video games are fun and so they see this and they think oh yeah well if my workplace is using these things then my workplace should also be fun and so it's this kind of deliberate confusion almost between like something that's really fun that you play by choice and something that is not really that fun that you're being made to play. Mm -hmm. And and I think those are the two big differences. In addition to that as well, you have an area around how they even use the coloring and the branding, like the way the confetti comes out and the colors that yeah. are being used are all, you know, appealing towards our senses, that design mechanism of how it's been designed is stimulating that part of our brain you notice much more than i do that gets us to react that way which is quite interesting when you mention on the feedback loop too it's funny because some people give out that they don't get enough feedback whereas mm. in these organizations the feedback loop is so tight especially sales is a great example so salesforce you know can monitor an entire company and i work very closely with some people who work in sales and you can literally see this leaderboard mm. and the leaderboard is uh, most calls emails uh, deals moved along, meetings in that week. Uh, what other elements are there? Deals closed, of course. And then you ring a bell. You know, you ring a bell that's yeah. in the office or whatever. Um, but how they how they use that then is the category is obviously the leaderboard. And if you're at the top, you know, you get a trophy. You genuinely get a trophy. And if you're at the bottom, you get cut. So, yeah. like, is there? How do you think about this in terms of feedback? Like, people, you know, innately need feedback. Do you think there's a there's a balance there? Like, how is that balance achieved in a corporate sense? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, there's a few things to sort of look at, like in a lot of jobs, it's not really as simple. It's not really possible to uh, measure people's performance in in those ways. Right. So, for example, Microsoft um, introduced this thing called like a productivity score as part of Microsoft 365, like a year or two ago. And they were measuring, you know, how many emails people are sending, how much they talked on Microsoft Teams calls, you know, all this stuff, how many documents they contributed to. And you think, 
Yeah, but that doesn't actually correspond necessarily to like how much useful work you're doing. Like you, you could like just be on all the calls, you know, and sending all the emails all the time. You'd be like number one on the leaderboards, and people would just be like, "What the hell is this guy doing?" Like he's just like mm -hmm. just just sending out these nonsense emails. And so, you know, I think we would like to believe that like everything that that we do can be measured, you know, in you know in such a straightforward way. And I think even you know. Um, you know, e even, you know, packing boxes or even sort of working, you know, in a cafe, it's like you could say, well, let's just go measure how many customers they serve, right? And the more customers they serve, the better. And you can see how they can go wrong. Maybe they're actually just, you know, produ you know, providing really bad or rude service while they're doing it. Or maybe they're sort of making a mess. And so I think that, you know, when you start focusing on just a few metrics, you have to be very careful. Um so that's kind of the, the main thing. I think the second thing is that at some point you have to decide what kind of company you want to be running. Like, you know, if you are always like rewarding like the top, you know, only the top people who are working the hardest and, and um, cutting the people at the bottom, you are going to end up with a company where people are just burning out, basically. <laughs> um, and, and does, you know, does that really work in the long term? Of course, you want people to be committed and, you know, working hard at the same time. Um, even the best people will burn out if they're, they're competing against each other all the time. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a terrible balance to try to to make because like metrics and KPIs. You know, we've been we're through this kind of new era whereby it's all data driven. You know, we we look at the KPIs, we look at the metrics, and then we just make decisions and based off that. But that only tells us as part of the story. Of course, you can use data and dashboards to to display this information, but that's why board meetings. And senior leadership meetings still have meetings where they discuss yeah. them and say why we're down 30 percent why we're at 60 percent and why we're at 90 percent and even people at 90 percent may might even be scrutinized even more because it's like oh how did your metric get so high whereas where i feel that people don't get this opportunity is obviously the people that are boxing that mm. are in uh, mm. mcdonald's workers that are only flipping enough burgers and that's where i feel that it's very yeah, injustice because they just look at this, you know, ten thousand employees, whatever, and just scrap the bottom. You know, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the worry I see a lot of this stuff. Um, from your research as well, like what type of research did you do for this? I'm very interested to know. Oh wow, um, you know, I I spent quite a lot of time looking at you know academic papers written about gamification. That there's quite a lot of like research, you know, on gamification out there kind of too much really um <laughs> and so i had to sort of pick the reviews you know where where you have researchers kind of looking at um a large number of papers you know and kind of trying to trying to aggregate and synthesize the results and so i was interested in like you know do people think this stuff is effective you know what are people using in the workplace um you know some of the later studies and um you know, it, it's a mixed bag, really, you know, like a lot of companies, obviously, just not very interested in sharing their findings, because it, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's sort of been a company secrets. Um, and usually, you know, if you're a company, and you let some researchers in to go and do a study on your gamification system, you probably don't want them to say, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, it's a bit embarrassing. Mm -hmm. so, so you're probably letting them in because you think it does work. And so you, you end up getting a bit of bias out there. I think the thing that I found doing the research is that th the issue is the way in which gamification is implemented, like, and whether it's effective or not, uh, in engaging people, motivating people, making them work better, you know, it's just so, it's so different because every company is different, you know, and a lot of the ways in which gamification is, is implemented is different. And so the way I kind of like talk about it is like, well, imagine if you did like a study to find out whether TV is good for you. And I'm just like, I don't know, like it's, I mean, like what, what TV are we talking about? Like, you know, like, you know, David Attenborough documentaries or, or reality TV shows or Netflix, you know, like you, mm -hmm. you can't just bundle these things together and say, well, you know, fast cutting shots, they're good. You know, that's kind of, I feel, where we are with a lot of gamification research, where it's just not really, um, it's a very difficult area to study, I think, and it's because getting access is hard, but it's also not really breaking down or looking at individual cases, um, you know, well enough. Also, it's really slow, like academia, it just takes like, 
you know, probably takes like two or three years, you know, from doing mm. the actual experiment to actually getting published. And so everything is just out of date instantly. Of course it is. And I think as well as well as that, there's like multifactorial, there's so much different, different things coming yeah. on and there's different ways to interpret it that especially within an organization where you're going to be exposed to a very narrow window, it reminds yeah. me of seeing like North Korea documentaries. They only expose a very small proportion of it. So you can't say that's a, available to everything. So they're kind of some of the ties, which is a bit difficult. And I imagine you ran into some issues when you're looking at governments as well. So when you started researching governments, how did that look? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, in, in many ways, that's in most ways, that's kind of harder to do because, um, you know, governments are very careful. A lot of governments are very careful about people's data. Some governments, you know, are, you know, will open themselves up to like inspection because, you know, that's just part of the process. Of course, if you're looking at more authoritarian governments like China, then then that's not going to happen. And so you, you just have to look at what people are saying, you know, and like looking at the, you know, how the gamification uh, is affecting people and, um, you know, what people are describing, you know, experiencing, you know, as part of that gamification. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, when, uh, you know, governments, local governments or, or state governments are employing gamification, it, it's really hard to know whether it quote-unquote works right but you can see what it's doing to people mm -hmm. of course what did you learn from observing china well i mean so i think a lot of people are probably aware of this idea of the chinese social credit score which is this this sort of like number that that citizens have that you know represents you know how good how good they are basically mm -hmm. you know do you pick up litter are you like donating are you like loyal to the party and all that sort of thing um, it, it's one of these things where like the reality is kind of a bit more complicated. Like, so, um, the short answer is that it's not really like there's one Chinese social credit score. It's more that, that, that like there's 20 or 30 experiments, you know, across mm -hmm. different cities. Um, and some of the apps also have kind of like financial scores, which are a bit different to credit scores. And so it's a bit of a patchwork of stuff. Um, and you know, there are you know, some cities where you will get deducted for like jaywalking, you know, and you will get deducted for just like, you know, um, you know, um, leaving litter and you will get points for volunteering at a charity. And if you have like a lot of points and you can get lower interest rates or you can skip the line at libraries or these sorts of things. Um, and so there are places where you look at it and you think, ah, it's not, you know, like, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, you will find stories of, of Chinese citizens being, you know, pretty unhappy about it because they think it's mm -hmm. unfair, you know, and the, the, the way in which the points are awarded or deducted is unfair. Uh, you'll see people saying, like, I don't even understand who who is even setting these targets. Like, you know, they're just mm -hmm. like magically appearing. You know, the apps don't work, that sort of thing. Um, but then you see people saying, actually, I quite like the app because if it stops people from being rude on the subway, then I'm all for it right and you kind of know honestly like there will be people a lot of people like you know in western democracies who'd be like well i don't know like as long as people stop littering and playing loud music you know then you know and running red lights then that sounds good to me so mm -hmm. it's it's kind of not at the point where it is this massive big brother like every single person has an app on their phone that tells them what what score they have but it's also obvious the chinese you know, state government and Chinese local governments are interested in this and they keep on trying. And during COVID, um, actually, it sort of intensified a little bit, it seems, because everyone had to install these uh, COVID um, tracking apps, you know, as they yeah. sort of were going around. So it's a it's an area where it's not maybe as bad as, as it, you know, maybe seems, but at the same time, you know, it's not like nothing is happening either. Yeah, my issue with this is the kind of how the data is aggregated. So like, as you said, there are some of the apps don't work and there's some of them, there's 30 of them. So it's kind of like if we are trying to take this holistic view of your credit score, your financial score or your societal score, well, then if you were a good citizen and app number seven doesn't work because it doesn't show that you picked up the, the litter in the trash, mm. well, now your score is, is lower. So it's kind of like we can't really use it, you know, a beta right. version of this it has to be like all or one and it looks to me from what you're describing is that it's not 
completely correctly uh, calculated. Like that's the issue here is that if you're going to yeah. take this data approach, scoring approach, well, then it better be accurate, the accuracy. Right. And, and then you sort of get down the road of like, well, is the answer always going to be, well, we should like have more surveillance and we should have more tracking, right? You know, <laughs> you know, because, because like you say, yeah, you know, like, you, you know, someone could say, well, I did this good thing and like no one knew about it. So like, what, like, that's not fair. And, you know, we should have another like, you know, camera there or another sensor um, or, or another way of measuring that. And so I, I think that that is, um, you know, it can be used as a justification for more surveillance. You know, I think that also, yeah, it's, it's people, you know, when it starts, when the stakes matter more, then um, it needs to be more and more accurate. And so, you know, you have cases where, you know, people might get uh, included on on a particular kind of blacklist, which means that they can't use like high speed trains. You know, they can't fly. You know, they can't sort of like get access to certain you know more luxury products and things like that. And so it's like you've got to be really careful, and you're going to have like you know recourse for people who feel that they've been inaccurately included. You know, on the list. And so I think there's this idea of like, well, it's just going to be perfect. You know, and we just like put cameras everywhere, and then everything gets scored, and everyone's going to be happy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we all know that that doesn't actually work that well. <laughs> like, you know, that mm -hmm. there's always like, gonna, you know, flaws in the system. So, even, so I guess my point is that even if you are someone who actually thinks that, like, you know what, social credit scores, if they promote good behavior, I'm for it. I'm like, I'm not even sure whether whether it's actually achievable in that way. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the issue is that you'll have people that will fall into that bottom bracket who will not get mortgages, who will not get houses, who cannot get a high speed yeah. train so it's it's a bit of an issue uh how i wanted to ask you and this is that how can someone score someone else so as you said someone being rude to someone can you literally look up their id and and rate them how does that work um you know i think it works i think it works differently in the different cities so there was um i think i read about this well they have cameras around like you know uh pedestrian crossings and things like that where they can just like spot you know, yep. whether someone, yep. you know, or, you know, traffic cameras or things like that. You know, I think that if you were like volunteering at a charity, probably, you know, they would scan your QR code and say, hey, this person volunteered today, or this person gave blood today, you know, or this person went on the litter picking, you know, uh, 30 minute, you know, uh, uh, mission today, or that sort of mm -hmm. thing. I, th I think that, the, um, yeah, you, you, if, I think if someone was just like rude to you on the subway, I'm not really sure how that would work, to be honest. Um, but uh, I don't know you, if you if you made like an official complaint, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a very slippery slope, though, because like the things we're discussing here are subjective, like the inputs, you know, so the input mm -hmm. values that you're putting in here, sure, they can be anything, you know, positive, yeah. negative, neutral. And yeah. now we have this scenario whereby you know, you could potentially limit someone's future opportunities. And the issue I have from here is that maybe those people don't have other alternatives. Like if you can't get a flight, then maybe you can't leave China to go explore a different life and, and go somewhere else. That's kind of the issue. You know, sometimes like you could say like, oh, get out of the US if you're not happy with politics, which is fine. Yeah. Just go somewhere else. But maybe if you don't get the other opportunity, that's the that's the kind of issue I have here. And it's a slippery, slippery slope because you've, you know, there's, you can get obviously very, conspiratorial of here and said oh it can go other aspects of the world but it definitely can like there's this principle that over time potentially these attributes that you've saw in games have moved from corporations to governments at this point and then for different governments yeah yeah and and you know part of the reason why this is happening is because it's just the technology is becoming cheaper and, and more ubiquitous and easier to do and so mm -hmm gamification is kind of a layer on top of those on top of those technologies so you know obviously in the past um you know we didn't have smartphones and we didn't have you know uh the internet of things and and, and so on and so once you install you know once everyone has a smartphone it becomes possible to literally track everyone and to kind of identify everyone which sounds mm -hmm. creepy i mean but at the same time we find our smartphones really really useful um and just the idea of being able to do that like 30 years ago it just seems like impossible or you know having 
uh, multiple, you know, surveillance cameras, you know, over every, you know, pedestrian intersection or on every single subway car, you know, using machine learning to score people's behavior or in every classroom, which they have now, you know, in a lot of schools in China um, to, to use, you know, CCTV to do that sort of thing. And so once you have that there, it's actually not that difficult to to like apply a score to that. In fact, it's almost like so tempting for people. It's like, well, we've got this camera here. We might as well start like using this data for something. Let's go and like rank people because that's just what we do, you know? Yeah, it's crazy. And I think with this as well is that the more control, you know, you give to someone, the less likely they are to give it up. That's kind of a, a big take home I've seen from, from like lockdowns and COVID is that there's always that fear of, Okay, we'll step away and then we'll we'll give control back. So maybe it's a, it's just an alarming thing to be aware of. You could go super down that rabbit hole, you know. But I think it's <laughs> a, it's it's something that's just like, you know, think of it for anything. If you have that control, it's very difficult to to, to relinquish it. When you were looking at uh, education as well, and I thought mm. that was kind of an interesting point on education is that, you know, we already have grade scores, and yeah. you could look at different educations throughout the world, and people do, you know. Uh, sixth form they do sixth grade all this kind of stuff and it will dictate the next path which seems traditional this was a traditional way we score people how has this kind of gamification element been taken too far from an education sense with children so i i think that's kind of like two i i find about two really fascinating things i i touched on one before which was the fact that in some schools in China that they're putting in um, machine learning, you know, cameras to to monitor the, the students and to basically score like how engaged they are. So so students will be like, oh, this person's like sleeping, <laughs> you know, or this person is, um, you know, excited or this person is studying really hard and they'll get ranked and then the scores can get sent to the parents, which sounds hmm, doesn't sound doesn't necessarily sound great but but maybe some parents would like to know if their kid is sleeping all the time in the class i don't know um but actually it seems that the most ubiquitous form of gamification in schools uh you know digital gamification is through this app called class dojo and so if you are a parent you probably have like heard of this actually it's like really popular it's used in, in, you know, um, in so many classrooms in the UK and, and internationally in, in the US. And basically, um, it, it's kind of a combination thing. It's a classroom management app combined with like a sort of classroom social network. And so the social network part is like really simple. It's like a way for, you know, the teacher to communicate with the parents and say, here's how your kid has been doing in school. So nothing too too bad about that. But the classroom management app is the really interesting thing. So basically, a teacher will get the app and they'll install it and they'll create like a little grid of the classroom layout. And each you know student has you know a place on that grid. And so if you tap on the student, you can then give them or deduct points. So so all the students have like a point score, and so you can give points for like hey good job you were quiet or good job you you uh you know you helped your your classmate or you can deduct points for speaking too loudly or um in some cases you know going to the toilet too much you know like student uh, teachers can set up any points systems they want in these things and yeah you know you get uh prizes if you have lots of points <laughs> <laughs> and but see, yeah. for, for kids it's weird because like it's almost it's almost like we wanted to you know get them to be like more diligent to you know just sit there and you know be pleasant and teach them manners but it's like when you add in that score element to it it changes at that it, point then and then it becomes yeah. something that they become kind of institutionalized from it i think that you know <laughs> I, I am always I, I probably try too hard in this book to be like generous to like everyone possible. So I'm always like, okay, like I am I am like I do like understand that teachers, God knows, you know, ha have a hard time, you know, in their classes, right? And so maybe mm -hmm. maybe they see this as a you know, and people will go and say, Well, it's a bit like in the past where we had used to have marbles, we put in marbles in a jar for the class's good behavior and, and that sort of thing. Um the the difference with this, the, I think the reason why it seems uh less pleasant is because the score is more permanent right you know like it, it's not it, it's something that 
it used to be that if you were probably like recording this stuff, it would just be like on a piece of paper, like, and you'd just be like, ah, I'm just going to go through this away this week and we'll just start again. And it, it's not something that could, could potentially get reported to parents. It's not something that could, you know, transfer, you know, month by month, term by term or year by year. And, you know, it's not something that is like so kind of um, so salient. So for example, you know, you talked about like you know, training kids. Apparently, one of the big one of the reasons why class soja is really effective is because of the sound effects. And so, when you like give someone like you know, uh, give someone points, then there's a nice sound effect. And when you deduct points, there's like a doo -doo -doo -doo, you know that that's just like a bad that, that's like a bad noise. And kids like recognize this noise now, and so when they hear it, they're like, oh. Who just got who just got their points deducted? And uh, there was this blog post from like a class dojo like expert, which has been deleted, <laughs> um, which basically said, "That's worrying." Yeah, which basically <laughs> said, "Oh wow, like my kids, you know, they they totally understand all these sound effects." And so here's one one trick you can do, which is you set up a fake student in the classroom, uh, and then you deduct points for them occasionally, and so the kids won't know who got their points deducted, but then when they hear that, they'll, they'll be really quiet because they don't want to get their points deducted as well. I'm like, I can't, that's amazing. <laughs> like, you know, like you're sort of using, <laughs> using the sound effect to kind of control, control the kids. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Man, the way you describe that is exactly like an earlier stage of the Amazon, the Uber. It's almost as if we're going to, you know, instill those methods at, at an earlier stage versus someone being 35 and becoming an Uber driver. The issue I have here is what could be the long-term psychological impacts of someone who follows this gamification model? Because if you're so used to, you know, that uh, drilled in approach to kind of walled environment of this is the game, well, then maybe when you get to university or maybe when you get to college or beyond college, you will be less uh, inspired mm -hmm. maybe to do something that's creative or do something that's completely all, all the kind of alternate because you're so used to working yeah. underneath a walled environment. That's kind of my concern here. Well, you know, uh, one answer is to just keep on, keep on gamifying it. You know, some universities are are in introducing, you know, these scores. You know, the problem is we don't know that there hasn't been a lot of research, you know, on this. Like, the, it, it's moving too quickly, and you know, it's really expensive and time consuming to do the kind of longitudinal, you know, studies on the effect of of this sort of gamification on people. I. Yeah, I'm I'm worried by it because one would think that if you are trying to motivate people extrinsically by like points and sound effects, that is not the way to to introduce a kind of love of learning, right? I think mm -hmm. we all probably acknowledge, hey, like it's not that bad, like if you do it like in moderation, right? Maybe it's maybe it's a good way to get people interested in a particular thing. But if you're doing it all the time, you know, in every class, uh, then then maybe it's sort of starting to become the reason for why people are doing things. So mm -hmm. we definitely need more research on that. Um, and you know, if you if you look at what some of the kids say, you know, there's one there's one kid who's interviewed about it who was like, oh yeah, like I feel it's a bit like when we go and give a treat to our dog at home. And I was like, hmm, interesting comparison. Yes. Mm -hmm. Worrying though, because like you you mentioned as a you know extrinsic or external you know the real idea is it should be intrinsic you know you should be doing something because you feel inspired to do it and you want to go yeah. do it and you want to go develop a learning and a passion for it and you know, even myself i wasn't that clued into school or even university i did a kind of software engineering slash kind of business information systems what it was called and then it wasn't until afterwards i kind of discovered my enjoyment for you know mobile development and product work and this kind of area and i started reading more and learning more because i kind of was interested in doing it and i kind of found my way let's say so it kind of feels like we are we're almost you you could be almost taking this away from a from especially a child which is like where they have that high level of neuroplasticity they could be learning as much as possible but instead they're focused on the streaks the confetti yeah. so yeah. that consideration you know what um what are the steps you want you take here to prevent this so let's look at it from multiple different areas let's look at the education one first um what are the preventative measures you would approach this with I mean, I think I think you need to have a really open conversation with everyone involved, you know, and, and that means, you know, the teachers and it means the students and it means the parents, you know, and go and say, look, OK, well, what is it that we want to do here? 
you know, do, are we happy having, having this app? How do we want it to be used? Um, what should the rewards and punishments be, right? You know, at the moment, uh, I, don't, I don't know that in every case, you know, like I, I know that I think in a lot of cases, parents can ask for their kid to be like removed from it. Yeah. Although then maybe you're sort of like being being like singled out for like being the kid who who's not on like Last Dojo, right? I I think that it's just you know it it's just being sort of introduced like automatically and maybe as a parent you don't want to be the one who's like gonna like single out your kid for like not being with the other kids and so you kind of need to do this as a community and try and get as many you know people involved and I think you would find if you if you had everyone thinking about it and like debating as we are doing now. Hey, what are the good things that could happen from this, and what are the bad things? Then you might, maybe they would even choose to keep Class Dojo, but they'd say, actually, we want to change the points and we want to wipe them every week or, or whatever, right? You need to just have people be a lot more aware uh, and more thoughtful about these things that are like intervening in people's lives. Mm -hmm. I would really want there to be. You know, Class Dojo is is a venture capital backed company. You know, it it was able to offer its product for free um, because it was just you know in sort of hyper growth mode, and so it sort of circumvented like a lot of like um, usual like mechanisms to review this stuff. Student, you know, teachers could just install it on their phones like automatically. Um, I think for these sorts of like applications where they're kind of just becoming like educational technology, right? You have to wonder, the, sh should this really be something that's controlled by a private company? You know, should you be looking at open source solutions that are easier for communities and for schools to modify to fit their purposes? But I'm sure you can, you know, customize, you know, Class Dojo to some extent, but um, it's not going to be the same if it was open source. I don't think everything needs to be open source, obviously, but... I think that there are some things where it's so important that, that you kind of need need to have more access there. Um, you know, more research to find out what effect it has on people long term. You know, I, I, there are some research saying it works. There's some research saying that um, in one classroom, apparently it, it made the kids be quieter, but then they were less interested in their class after that. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That doesn't sound too good to me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, you know, like I'm not saying... Oh, ban everything tomorrow. I'm saying that that we we need to think about you know more more openly about about what it is we're doing here. Yeah, and you made a great point that like you know there is there could be a problem there is a problem, positive element to this like the competitive side of people they can see a goal and see you know how to kind of reach a goal and achieve that kind of streaks or whatnot. But there's a counter side of it that you don't want to be the bracket of users from 2020 to 2040 that were exposed to this horrific element of gamification. And then we look back in 30 years and say, oh, well, all this research, research that we we're completely wrong with doing with children, you know? Because yeah. it's, it's a bit uh, kind of unfair that, you know, it's kind of like when people choose their life for their children before they give mm. them a chance, a child, a, give, give the child a chance to do what they want. You know, it's kind of like, well, you know, they're so young that they have to be, you know, natured and nurtured at the same time. So there's that kind of that element, but then for an adult, it's quite interesting because how would you approach it from a corporation perspective in that element? Like how does the employee take um, more agency in what he does to not succumb to these gamifications? And at the same vein, you know, you have government intervention too. I mean, you know, it's really, it's really hard on workplaces because it's not really, you know, the, you know, the, um, you know, most companies, when you when you walk into work, it kind of feels like you basically have no rights whatsoever, right? <laughs> you know, like you you know, for those eight hours, they can just order you to do what whatever they want. And you know, corporations aren't democracies. You know that that you know that <laughs> I think people understand that that's what happens when when they're getting paid to do the work. At the same time, we do have regulations on workplaces to make sure that they are, you know, um, that that they're safe to work in. That, that people get breaks, you know, that people are treated fairly. Um, so I don't know that there's like anything really that individual workers can do about like, you know, their workplace being gamified. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing more, more workers form unions. We're seeing, you know, government starting to look into, you know, what might be happening um, in terms of like uh, algorithms that are sort of ranking and judging employees. So I think, I think it was in New York or California you know, there's, there's been, you know, law introduced or they want to introduce it where 
people, where workers will be allowed to see, you know, any scores that, that exist on them. They'll be able to kind of understand like how they've been scored. You know, I think it's just making it a bit more transparent. You know, I don't think people are saying, well, there should be no performance reviews, full stop, right? I think people like, get that. That's okay. But it's it's more um, making sure the effects of this gamification do not lead people to, you know, performing unhealthy behaviors. But right? you could see that if you had some prize of like $500 for the person who packs the most boxes in the day, it's like, do we really want that? I don't know. And then, then the bottom 10% get fired, right? You know, like that, that seems like a recipe for disaster, you know, to some extent. Mm -hmm. You'll get a lot of boxes packed and then people will just hurt themselves, right? And so we, we just don't let people do that, you know? Mm -hmm. you, but you describe something that's happening these days, maybe over the course of a month or, or a quarter or whatever, but it's like that competitive element they, they instill in companies such that people actually have anim animosity between each other. Because yeah. they're going to be fighting over each other to, to get this, get this shiny object. So there's kind of that element of it, and I think another element there is the, the privacy side of it. So by not exposing someone too much to give too much of their life, or or taking them for granted, or whatnot, pushing them that bit harder, then at yeah. that point you can maybe achieve this. But it, it's difficult because, as you said there, you know if they're playing that game and there's there's a game happening within the organization, it's very difficult to, to step to be to be the one that's not doing you know, yeah. the bullshit meetings and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> no, I, I think I think it's really hard to sort of be the person who says no. I think you know one one of the bits of advice I give in the book is that I just think that if you're going to have prizes and punishments, you need to keep them small, right? You can't if you start saying, well, here's a prize of like ten thousand dollars for the top performer. People are going to do all sorts of things to win that prize. And not necessarily the things you want them to do. So, like they'll cheat, exactly. you know, you, you know, yeah. or, or they'll screw over their you know, their coworkers, or that sort of thing, or they'll burn themselves out. And so, I don't, you know, like it's particularly in sales. Obviously, you know, it's ve it's very normal for for there to be kind of incentives, you know, for top performers. I, you know, like if I look at my own, you know, company, if I look at you know other companies that adm I admire. The pay is important. You know, people need to feel like you know well compensated. They don't need to be worrying about you know their household bills. At the same time, I think most people recognize that the people work for a mixture of pay and you know feeling that they're valued and feeling that they're doing meaningful work. You know, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I don't think you know I, to me like saying oh, well, here's a big prize for the top performer. I'm like, you're kind of like saying that there's not really any other reason to be doing the work, right, other than the prize. Mm -hmm. And so the bigger the prize, you know, the more um, almost, it's almost like you're sort of sucking meaning away from the rest of the work, you know, by by having a bigger prize. And so you just need to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. Sales is huge for that as well, because it's, you know, it doesn't matter what you're selling, you're just looking for the bonus or the cash bonus, whatever, but often people will neglect that if they did focus yeah. on that kind of career fulfillment. And I always talk about that on my podcast, like fulfillment, passion and, and purpose. That's very much more tailored, I think, towards like a software environment, you know, something mm. that you're building or something that I'm building, you know, that you genuinely feel is actually making users uh, you yeah. know, more fit in yeah. your example or, or yeah. whatnot. And then when you're committed to that vision, I feel like that's much more purposeful and that will yield the best results. Cause I often even find it in even my own company that like, the people that stay there the longest are the people that have really committed to, to yeah. the divisions of what the company inspires to actually be versus what they're trying to pretend to be. I, th I think most people in, in, you know, the video games industry, you know, we have some amazing people in our company, you know, and, and they know that they can get paid a lot more money working in a different company. Like, you know, we have people who used to work at, you know, Yahoo, who could work at Google, who could work at Apple, you know, just really great, you know, developers and production people and you know they choose to frankly earn less you know and and work you know at our company and work at companies like it because you know they can get up in the morning and think hey like everything that i'm doing here is a like, good for people right i don't have to feel conflicted about what i'm doing and i'm not like sitting here like judging everyone in every other company it's more just that it you know the more I've been doing this, you know, the more I like value being able to sort of get up and think, you know what, I at least I don't need to worry about whether I'm, you know, about the sort of ethics of what I'm doing, because I, I thought about that. And, and it's good. And, um, you know, that's something that money 
you know can't buy that then again there are some things that money can buy so you you, you do need the money as well <laughs> of course of course especially for like highly skilled workers that are being yeah. pushed very hard in these areas last question i want to ask you was around separating those ethics so and, and being able to draw the line so for for companies who you know they want to make that shift where do you draw the line between kind of ethics and profit because if you if you pull down the um gamification element maybe their profit margin will become more slim or, or revenue might be reduced or whatnot look i think it's really hard i mean you know the, the fact is is that we could all I, I think almost everyone could be earning more money doing a different kind of job right you know like um whatever that might be right and so uh most people in in the video games industry could be earning twice as much money in the finance industry Right. You know, and most and people in the finance industry could be earning more money, you know, sort of doing criminal stuff or whatever. Right. Like you, we, we can all sort of like get more money in different ways. So it, it's not like there's never a choice. And some people feel like they haven't made a choice, but in a way they kind of have, you know, by, by where they are right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people need to decide, you know, take a step back and think about what, what it is they, they want to be doing with their lives and what they need. Um, you know, I've seen people who are very wealthy, who do not seem happy at all. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, vice versa. I think with ethics versus profit, the, a big problem, uh, you know, we used to have companies who came to us to six to start and they would offer to buy the location data of our players. Right. Um, cause we, you know, as a running app, we, you know, have access to users' GPS traces. Like we have to do that, otherwise we can't know where they are. And they were like, look, if we if you give us access to this stuff, then we can target ads and we'll give you like tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. And most, I mean, a lot of companies did this, right? Um, and you just wouldn't hear about it. And so we would always say no, because we just don't want to sell that data. And honestly, like um, if we did it, probably the players wouldn't know and if they did know, they wouldn't care, right? A lot of a lot of players, because like everyone does it. And we just decided, well, we don't want to be that kind of company, you know, and we don't want to make our money that way. And sometimes you just have to make a decision. Um, it's easier to make that decision if you're already making money, right? So that's why it's important to have a sustainable business model. If you don't have a sustainable business model, you can't make those choices because you have to take the money, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost made it more important that we figure out okay, we're going to sell subscriptions and they're going to cost us amount of money and that way we can be profitable. So that's, it, it, it almost makes having a proper you know, business model better um, or more important. It's the opposite to high growth startups these days because like if you think about Facebook, Facebook led with, you know, uh, user acquisition and then they led with, okay, we have no cash and then started <laughs> selling it, ad advertising, reverse ad advertising and whatnot. So it's kind of like that flip side approach. But it's good yeah. that we've been able to see those learnings. Like you, you mentioned some, you know, there's loads of examples I could think of. And now the flip side is, oh, well, if you build something that's sustainable, it's well structured, you don't need to succumb to those yeah. things. And I suppose that's the best area of, of ethics because the line is always grayed and blurred out. Yeah, exactly. Adrian, I just say a massive thank you, man. I really, really appreciate it. Before we finish up, can you let uh, everyone know where they can find your book and all that, all your good stuff? Yeah, um, so you can find the book pretty much anywhere. Just search for "You've Been Played," and um, you're, you know, it, it's uh, the one that is all about gamification. Uh, so it's on Amazon bookstores um, out September the eighth. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Adrian Hon, uh, so you can find me there. Um, I've got a blog, um, link from my Twitter. So yeah, looking forward to seeing what people think of the book of course and i'll have all the details down below in the show notes as always so i just say a massive thank you i really appreciate it